Welcome to lecture number 63, historical topic 6.9, responses to immigration in the Gilded Age, and the theme is migration and settlement. The learning objective is explain the various responses to immigration in the period over time. And the first key concept is increasing public debates over assimilation and Americanization accompanied the growth of international migration. Migration that's coming during the Gilded Age is coming mostly from Southern and Eastern Europe. These are people who speak languages that are most different than English and than previous other immigrants. The Irish in the mid-century spoke English, and the Germans had at this point mostly assimilated. Immigrants that are coming from places like Italy, Greece, Turkey, Ukraine, and parts of Russia face a nativist backlash partly because they are seen as far too different than the typical American. The backlash manifests through the formation of organizations like the American Protective Association and the Immigration Restriction League. The perception was that because they were living in cities and these cities were dirty and had poor conditions, that therefore the people that lived there were lesser people. This was further fueled by racial theories and social Darwinism developed by sociologist Herbert Spencer. There's also a sense of anti-Catholicism that is a continuity from the previous period. The political cartoon from the American Protective Association on the top of the screen portrays the Catholic Church in the United States being controlled by Rome and the Pope with their hands or tentacles in the different parts of government. Labor unions initially disliked immigrants because they claimed that they were the source of wage depression. The industrialized disliked immigrants, claiming that they brought in radical ideas and that they would organize the workers into unions. The political cartoon on the bottom right also shows the political implications of greater immigration. Naturalization to become a U.S. citizen took five years, granting new immigrants the vote. The criticism was that immigrants did not assimilate fast enough for the liking of most Americans and thus should increase the naturalization period. Another fear was that the country would be full of what was known as hyphenated Americans, as in Italian Americans or Greek Americans or Ukrainian Americans, and that they would not shed their previous culture or their previous identities to become fully American. This hyphenated American charge is used through the 20th century as a veiled anti-immigrant attack on people that is even adopted by U.S. President Teddy Roosevelt. There is also a legal backlash against immigrants. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act is passed, keeping out further Chinese immigration. Those in the United States that were Chinese were allowed to remain but would never be eligible for citizenship, and if they ever left, they wouldn't be able to come back. This was fueled by nativism on the West Coast. The fear that the Chinese immigrants were taking American jobs resulted in support for the law. The United States Supreme Court case, the United States v. Wong Kim Ark, in 1898, considered the status of second generation of Chinese migrants, those who were born in the United States to Chinese parents. The court ruled that if they were born in the United States, regardless of their parents' status or race, they were considered U.S. citizens. Birthright citizenship is established as a result of this court case and continues to be precedent. Legislation in this time period begins to define excludable aliens. That means immigrants who are not going to be allowed into the United States. This is all fueled by nativist sentiment of the late 19th century. There are several immigration laws that are passed in 1882 and 1897, then more added in 1917, 1922, and 1924. The earliest excludable aliens are convicts, lunatics, prostitutes, and those likely to become a public charge, or anyone with contagious diseases. Later added to the list are anarchists and anyone unable to pass a literacy test. Now that all these laws are passed that are supposed to keep some immigrants out of the United States, agencies and screening centers needed to be built to enforce these laws. This is where Ellis Island comes into existence. Ellis Island becomes the largest screening center for new immigrants coming into the United States. It is, as the name suggests, a separate island off the coast of the island of Manhattan in New York City. Immigrants would be dropped off at the screening center before being allowed to go into the city. They would go through medical screenings and would be asked questions about where they were coming from. If they had any diseases or if they were convicts, lunatics, prostitutes, or likely to become a public charge, then they would be sent back at the boat company's expense. The percentage of people who were excluded at Ellis Island was still pretty low, and even despite all of this legislation, immigrants made up about 12-15% to 15 of Americans throughout the entire period. The second part of this key concept is about their experience in the U.S. Many immigrants negotiated compromises between the cultures they brought and the culture they found in the United States. Immigrants concentrated in ethnic neighborhoods. An example of this is Chinatowns, which are present throughout the United States. They were established in the 19th century as a result of Chinese workers living in the same neighborhood, sometimes as a result of discriminatory housing laws. They helped retain language, cultural practices, and community support. For ethnic neighborhoods in the Northeast, especially in New York City, they are used to facilitate political organization using political machines. When migrants become U.S. citizens after living in the United States for five years, political machines like Tammany Hall take advantage of people that live in the same area with a similar background. 
Political machines would help immigrants settle into new cities. They would help find jobs for them and places for them to live or rooms to rent. They knew that once they became voters, they would remember the organization that helped them acclimatize themselves to their new home. The theory of the melting pot begins to develop in this time period. This implies that people that are coming from other parts of the world into the United States are going to assimilate into the American culture. For the purposes of the metaphor, they're going to melt into the larger culture. This implies that they're going to lose aspects of their identity while possibly adding some aspects of their previous culture to American society. The melting pot was the way in which people envisioned immigrant society for a lot of the 20th century. Today, other food metaphors are used, but one in which different parts retain their unique characteristics. So maybe more like a stew or a salad or a burrito bowl from Chipotle where the guac is extra, but you pay for it anyways because it makes the whole thing better. The assimilation that nativists were looking for was actually most often seen with the younger generations. The second generation of immigrants can either refer to the children of immigrants brought to the U.S. or the first generation born in the U.S. The reason why these younger generations will assimilate much faster is because of the growth of the public school system at the end of the century. The next key concept says many women, like Jane Addams, worked in settlement houses to help immigrants adapt to U.S. language and customs. Settlement houses acted as community centers and helped immigrants acclimate themselves to the new setting. Jane Addams was a reformer during this time period. Her settlement house was called Whole House and it was in Chicago. The services that they provided at Whole House and other settlement houses vary by the population that they served. Sometimes they would try to provide certain services and then they would have a positive impact at a manageable cost, like a bread line or providing meals. Sometimes they would help with landlords and renting out rooms, and they could also help with child care for parents who worked. Jane Addams tells her story of running Whole House in her memoir, 20 Years at Whole House. She mentions trying the different things because at this point it's all experimental. The field of social work is largely developed as a result of the work that settlement houses do in this time period. Large immigrant populations were moving into cities, so often the settlement house had to contend with the slumlords, political machines, and lack of funds. Settlement houses were self-funded and volunteer-run. They didn't receive money from the state or federal government, and they were trying their best to do their best for immigrants in that community. The final key concept says, social commentators advocated theories later described as social Darwinism to justify the success of those at the top of the socioeconomic structure as both appropriate and inevitable. Social Darwinism comes from Charles Darwin's theory of evolution that he first introduced in his book On the Origins of Species. He describes the evolution of species as they adapt to their environments. The British philosopher Herbert Spencer read On the Origins of Species and argued that it could be adapted to human society as well. He is the one that came up with the phrase survival of the fittest. While Charles Darwin only saw this idea as being applied to nature and other species of animals, Herbert Spencer wanted to apply this more broadly. He applied it to people of different races and starts to use immaterial physical characteristics like cranium size to classify people into those that are fitter and those that are lesser. He used pseudosciences to further racist ideologies to place immigrants from southern and eastern Europe as less capable than those from northern and western Europe. He also uses similar concepts to apply to business to defend the monopolistic size that some companies have attained at the expense of smaller competitors. And finally, here's the recap. Immigrants faced the backlash as they continued to come in large numbers. Legislation was passed to limit immigration from China and identify excludable aliens. Assimilation happened, though, mostly in the later generations. The settlement house movement helped acclimate immigrants to new locations, and the new theories used in justifying business success extended into racial theories. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, you can click on the video link on the screen. And if you're looking for more practice to help you on the AP exam, you can visit apushlights.com. I wish you the very best in all of your studying and look forward to seeing you back on the next lecture.